10 second security tip. Go. Uh, you should understand the, the assets that you have available on your perimeter and understand what services are exposed via them and be able to map those back to your crown jewels and applications inside. It's time to begin the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. Welcome, everybody, to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. I am David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. And to my left is a man formerly known as the CISO of Lyft, Mike Johnson, now just the co-host of the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. Are you okay with that title? I'm really good with that title, but I'm, I'm not changing my name. I'm not changing to Assemble. Okay. I, you know, so I draw the line at that, but I'm happy to be the co-host of the CISO Security Relationship Pen. So you can't even say Every it. time. <laughs> it's written here. Look, yes. look at my mic flag. So it's written I, right there. I'm, I'm really happy to be known as the co-host of the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. Thank you very much. By the way, if anyone's tweeting or LinkedIn-ing or anything like that, our hashtag is CISO Series. And let me also make a request. You all have mobile phones. You're sitting here. You're watching us. You're probably going to be tweeting or paying full rapid attention, which I appreciate right now, but feel free to write a review of the podcast while you're watching the podcast. What a novel, cool, funky idea to do. So you could do that. Or, you know, we also have another podcast called Defense in Depth. Anyways, we are doing this during the week of RSA, and I'm just going to ask you one question, Mike, before we introduce our guest. Mike, why did you refuse to go to RSA? I really think that RSA, it's, it's just... Absolutely overwhelming. No and, argument you know, here. So, so going to that, the floor, the expo, I don't know how to get value out of that. Even though I'm now on vacation and, and have a lot of free time, even then just walking around just seemed too overwhelming. So that's really what keeps me from being a participant in the expo itself is it's just too much. It's too overwhelming. I will not disagree with you. It is way, way overwhelming. But I will tell you this, I ran into a lot of fans of the podcast who were on the floor and they speak very, very highly of it. So I want you to know that we have plenty, plenty of fans that are out there on the floor. Now, awesome. let me introduce our guest who's sitting here to my far left. It is Melody Hildebrand, the CISO of Fox. Melody, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. It's time for Ask a CISO. All right. It has been reported many times that the average life of a CISO is 18 months. And Mike, you lasted 18 months at Lyft. Now, I also want to point out, I think this stat is 100% anecdotal. It's so commonly reported, and I cannot find a single source for this. But the irony is, at the time of your departure, so many people were forwarding me articles regarding the stress level of CISOs, most notably around nominate study that claimed that one in five CISOs turn to alcohol or self-medicating. Regardless of this study, do you feel that being a CISO was the most high-pressure job you had, and would you be eager and willing to jump back into the CISO role again? So first of all, yes, very high pressure. I am not one who self-medicates, so I guess I'm in the four out of five. But it really is a lot of pressure to feel that weight of what is it that we need to be doing as a company to be secure? What is it that we need to be doing to protect the data of our customers who have entrusted us within that and do it quickly and do it with keeping the rest of the organization happy, keeping the board of directors happy. It, it's, it really is a lot of pressure. At the same time, it's also very rewarding. You know, you can look back and say, hey, here's what we've done. People are coming to us because of what we're doing from a security or data privacy perspective. That's a very rewarding feeling. And that, for me, outweighs the stress. So absolutely, I'm, I'm frankly planning on jumping back into the saddle again. All right. Well, that's a call out to all companies, I would assume. No, no, it's not. It's not a call out to all companies? All right. G give me a couple months. All right. He wants, you want to uh, de-stress. All right, Melody, this, obviously you are still holding the CISO. Let me ask you, how long have you been the CISO of Fox? 20 months. Hey. 20, so you have broken the trend. So uh, kudos to you. That means there's somebody who left at 16 months, according to this study. Where are you feeling the most pressure in your role? 
Yeah, so I think it, it certainly is a stressful job. I'm not sure it's a uniquely stressful in the enterprise. I certainly look at my colleagues across engineering and in IT, and you know, there's a lot of places that, particularly in technology roles, are feeling that, that they are increasingly in the spotlight in terms of what they're delivering. I've, I've been at a bunch of CISO events this week that have been jokingly called, this is a new one for me, the CISO, the Chief Impending Sacrifice Officer, which <laughs> I think kind of reflects what, what can be what is sometimes perceived as the inherent loneliness of the job, you know, the sense that you're kind of waiting for the moment when something will go wrong and you will be thrown under the bus. And I, the, for me, at least, the best strategy to counteract that is to kind of open the tent a little bit more and not make it, you know, a martyred position where, you know, I'm holding security for the firm. It's much more collaborative, and there are a lot of people who have security at stake. So you make sure a lot of people go down when something happens. <laughs> is that the or idea? Or a lot of people support you up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So let me ask... I remember I asked you this question, Mike, about how you deal with stress, and you had some Slack channels that you would vent on. Melody, are you self-medicating, or do you find a more healthy way to uh, deal with stress? Uh, I mean, so that's how actually I've met Mike, was on one of those communities. Um, so I th certainly think the community aspect is super valuable. Hold on, wait, can you tell me some of the things he vented about on that channel? No. Uh, it's a yeah, come on, tell me. He said Mike's not That's what today. makes it a good place to vent. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, I'm personally, uh, you know, a practicing yogi and try to have my Zen opportunities. And I think finding that that kind of balance is important to capture those moments. So I, I liked what you said there about it sometimes feeling very lonely. And, and that's really what I've found with the community is you can talk with other folks who've been there and they can relate to your experiences. And it feels you, you feel less lonely by having those conversations. So I, I liked what you said there about it, and that's what those communities really are all about, is supporting each other. So what would your advice, Mike, as maybe any missteps you may have had in the past with regards to sort of dealing with stress, what would be your top advice to other CISOs for dealing with stress? It really is find other people who've been there. Find those communities, have those conversations, maybe be vulnerable. Put, so did, in, in a case when you had to vent on something, ah. what was, you don't have to tell me what you vented on unless you do want to, because I still want to really hear that. <laughs> what was the kind of support you got back? So it's a combination of, yeah, I get it. I've been there. I, I, can, I can relate. And some of it is, well, here's how I dealt with that situation. So and some, did you, by the way, did you actually take a good suggestion? Absolutely. Okay. None comes immediately to mind, but time and time again, we have these conversations. I mean, talking with Melody, some of the things that she's had to deal with, the challenges that she's faced, we learn a lot from each other. And oftentimes we can say, hey, I had this problem. This, this whole situation sucked. You know, have you run into it? Yes, I have. And how did you deal with it? So it's, it's really find a support network have those conversations and know that other people have been there before and, and can help you through it. Why is everyone talking about this now? All right, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote an article entitled 30 Security Behaviors That Set Off a CISO's BS Detector. There was quite a response from the community to this. Mike and Melody, I'll start with you, Melody. Because you, you were at RSA. Mike, you weren't, so you can't answer this question. <laughs> Did you see or hear anything at RSA that set off your BS detector, Melody? Yes. You don't have to name the company, but I want to know what the pitch was. Well, I, I walked the floor today for the first time, and I was trying to capture a few things. One, I was looking for the most dubious claim. Uh, I was looking for my favorite booth, and I was trying to find the best pun. Okay. And so th that was my hunt, which makes it a little more fun to walk the floor if you kind of have a mission like that. So do you want to hear my most yes, dubious claim? I think the most dubious claim, I'm going to leave out the company, but you can Google this and it'll be obvious, but total security, one simple plan, the cybersecurity architecture of the future. And that alone was like kind of cheesy, but what really got me was that that was the headline, and then below it was like a box with like 75 icons that essentially had, each had, like if you were to summarize like every single tool or thing that existed on the floor, but inside one platform. So it was like access management, zero day threat protection, applied machine learning, artificial intelligence, next generation SIEM, but it was in one box that you could deploy as a 
box, I guess, um, and do the things. And I, I found that to be dubious. That does a lot. Yeah. Sounds like an amazing box. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Was there any, you, you took a look at the list. What, what was very interesting, when I reached out to a bunch of CISOs on this, half of them sent me stuff and they said, I can send you more if you need it. And I already got a <laughs> list of 30. So what did I miss on this list? Do you feel that I missed anything on the list or is it pretty much I hit all the, the highlights? I think the themes you talked about were the right ones um, and, and kind of reflect some of what can be overwhelming about trying to navigate the environment. Yeah, and for those of you who hadn't read the article, it just it, it had a bunch of themes of like saying that you're no one does it like you, you know, you do 100% protection, we will make you compliant, it is compliant, you know, there's a lot of sort of extremes and also so sort of demanding that you consume certain content of theirs. There's, there's a it kind of fell along the themes. I think some of that was the combination of themes that I, I saw today. So it was both the claiming to do it all claim, which I think you alluded to, but then also like ease of install claim, like things that felt just kind of inherently in conflict. So a lot, like that one I think had another tagline, which was, you know, one click install or deploys in minutes. And the two things just, I, and I think that are, for, for deploying complex problems, like I, I wouldn't expect it to deploy in minutes. You know, it's not like that is a criteria that is necessarily important for all decisions. And but those those two claims that just seem fundamentally contradictory. But no one like is anyone in your department going, find me something that clicks just once and installs, and that's all I need. I just want that. You know, nobody's demanding that, yeah. are they? Mike, what I think they're trying to get at is, you know, this, it's, it's really easy to install, which I do think people want. Something that's going to take an entire team of consultants to set up, that's not interesting. But I, I do think it's... So would you be okay so with the claim of simple to install? Yes? Would you be okay with that claim, or is that even too much? Uh, I, I think, I mean, you could even just be honest. It's like, we can be up and running in 30 days with very little... Many know, claim 10 minutes, by the way. Yeah, and, and it's, it's frankly impossible to get that working in 10 minutes whatever it is, you know, getting integrated into your own environment in 10 minutes. I have trouble even sometimes getting my email in 10 minutes. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think it's what they're trying to say is it's easy to install, but they're going just so far off into an extreme that it becomes farcical and, and nobody believes what they're having to say. By the way, I, I just realized that I have forgotten someone very, very important on this show who's over here, who's running the audio. Oh, hi. John Adams. Hey. I just, it dawned on me, I did not make it a proper introduction oh. to you at the beginning of the show. John ran security over at Twitter. Small company. Small company at Twitter, and he's doing audio right now, so please accept my apologies. Oh. I, it literally just slipped oh, my this mind. This is what happens when you do security for too long. You gotta <laughs> go do audio, you know? So, John, <laughs> for, jump in here, yeah. though. Were you at RSA, by the way? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any dubious claims that you saw? Most of the floor. Most of the floor. <laughs> I think every time I see that uh, AI or machine learning will solve the problems that people can't solve, it's very upsetting. I had a very interesting conversation with Davi Ottenheimer, who's giving a talk on oh. Friday about machine learning failures. Which was I he real or a bot? Fascinating. <laughs> what? I said, was he real or a bot? No, he was real. Oh, okay. He was real. But he was talking about like, you know, uh, like when Google was like racist and they it claimed African Americans like gorillas. And what I did not know about that story was that the the machine learning that Google had was actually identifying both whites and blacks as animals, but there were white employees to actually fix it. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem when you don't have diversity. Ta-da. Yeah, that, that story was entirely about diversity. And, and it was really an example of the world that we're creating if we're basing everything off of machine learning and, and AI going forward in a world where you don't have diversity, it's in a way going to reinforce that lack of diversity. It's time to play What's Worse. All right, everybody, you know how this game is played. I uh, give a scenario to Mike and our guest, and they are really kind of horrible scenarios. And your job is to determine which of these two horrible scenarios is the worst of them. Many of the people in this crowd has heard the show before, but if you haven't, that's how this game is played. It is a risk mitigation analysis type game, if you will. All right, this first question comes in. We have two rounds of this. Are you ready? And I always make Mike answer first. I'm ready. From Roberto Arico of Carbon Black, he asks, what's worse, 
having corporate laptops and desktops where everyone is local admin, sounds pretty bad, all right, or BYOD with no visibility or controls. Mike, which one's worse? Um, so I've experienced both of these. Oh, you have? Um, okay. Not necessarily at the same time, um, but, you know, if, if you're looking at, uh, you know, everyone has admin access, um, that certainly has its own challenges versus BYOD, um, where you're not having any control. I think ultimately the BYOD scenario where you don't have visibility, you don't know what's going on, that feels like the worst one. Um, at least even if people are admins on your own systems, you can implement compensating controls. So I really think that BYOD is, is really the worst of the two. All right. Melody, what's worse? Having corporate laptops, desktops where everyone is a local admin or BYOD with no visibility or control. I'm actually going to take the opposite view of my Great. This awesome. Event. We love this. Um, I don't like either. I would... Well, nobody does. I have experienced <laughs> both. Um, so I guess the no compensating controls for the latter is a little hard for me to, to fully wrap my head around. My hope is that even in a BYOD environment, and Fox is a highly BYOD environment, we're all creatives. You don't tell James Cameron what machine to use. Um, you know, that you can look at application level data to actually understand what's happening. Um, and I'd rather have that than... Um, you know, having a single infected laptop being able to move and you know, propagate through my entire environment. So I guess I'm hopeful, maybe it's cheating, but that I can have some <laughs> amount of application level visibility, which makes me more comfortable with a BYOD environment. And I think okay. BYOD is the future. So Excellent. Split decision. All yes. right. Next question. And this one comes from Peter Lurie of Microsoft. And he asks, what's worse, prohibiting all cloud use by corporate fiat and yet turning a blind eye to shadow IT's rampant cloud use, or you permit cloud use, but you don't have any proper controls in place to protect it. Shadow IT basically saying, thinking that you're, you're better off than you are, basically saying, this is the cloud that you're supposed to use, and that's all that you can do, and then not paying attention to the shadow IT, that's, that's worse. I, I would rather have at least kind of people understanding what the rules are, agreeing to what the rules are, hopefully play, you know, playing by the rules, than assuming that I'm better off than I actually am. Okay. Uh, you're nodding in agreement? Are you in agreement? I agree with the this? answer for a different reason, which is I think there's nothing worse in security than stating policies that you then willfully ignore and, and fail to actually try to implement because it just undermines your credibility on everything else that you try to do. So it's much better to actually not have a policy than to have a policy that you ignore. We've actually addressed that on a previous episode, and Mike agrees with you on that, I, too. I yes? agree. Awesome. Well, great. Do you want to come work at Fox? <laughs> <laughs> Who's our sponsor this week? It's Axonius, uh, one of two sponsors today for the live podcast that we have here. And I will tell you something. Axonius is a company solving the least sexy part of cybersecurity, and that's asset management. And let me say something about these guys. They have just run the playbook of the perfect RSA. All right, so they just won two massive awards as a complete rookie here. They won the most innovative startup at the Innovation Sandbox, and they won the SC Award of the Rookie Security Company of the Year. And you pretty much couldn't have asked for much better than landing both of those. And I should mention that Exonius was a previous sponsor of the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. We had their CEO, Dean Sisman, on the show as well and they came back and they sponsored again and i'm gonna take credit and say that if you sponsor this show mike back me up on this you will win an award at rsa yes absolutely yes 100 percent, without yeah. a doubt yeah so this would be a good suggestion to other companies if they want to sponsor this podcast and you do want to win an award at rsa that the two go hand in hand. There is a direct correlation. Direct correlation. All right. You're backing me up on this? It's conclusive. <laughs> yes, thank you. What's a CISO to do? Uh, 
All right, Melody, this is all for you right now. I'm, I'm extremely eager to hear what you have to say about this. Because on our show, when we talk about security, we're almost always talking about protecting customer and employee data, more or less. So while all companies have intellectual property they need to protect, you have some really high-profile individual assets that are of interest to many hackers. So I'm really intrigued if you can kind of walk us through just some basic factors that you consider that most security people probably aren't even thinking about when you're trying to secure a single media asset that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. So start us down this road. We're going to sit back and listen. Uh, sure. So, I, you know, media, I think I'm largely blessed, but very occasionally cursed in that it's largely unregulated from a security perspective. I think one probably underappreciated thing is that means that, you know, in conversations with partners, for example, that means that usually a lot of the expectations, particularly from a liability perspective, are just totally irrelevant. Because as you know, most things are about, you know, PII loss or, you know, require disclosure requirements to the government around, you know, personal information. Uh, and that's just not relevant very much to my world. I and mean, we have some amount, an increasing amount, as all media companies are becoming more direct to consumer. We have consumer data. We're collecting payment information. But most of our business is about intellectual property. So if I'm talking to a supplier about collaborating around Avatar, Avatar 2 through 5, you guys should get excited now. It's coming out. <laughs> um, we're spending about a billion dollars on it. And having conversations around PII loss is just totally irrelevant. Obviously, the, the, the risk there is piracy. And so that has, I think that's where the, the industry is like not quite as mature as in those conversations. You just kind of have to accept a decent amount of risk. I think in, in the film and television industry, I think one thing that's also probably underappreciated is that it really just is a crazy supply chain problem. So again, Avatar example, we have something like 250 third parties that are working on the content. I mean, these are you know visual wow. effects designers, sound editors, you know composers. These are definitionally people who are outside of our perimeter. These are the best people who do these things. Um, they don't work for Fox full time. They're obviously not on Fox issued laptops. And so I, there's actually very little investment, I think, uh, in, from the industry around really working on this problem. But, you know, we, we have to think about kind of every one of those potential parties being a way for that data to be exposed. So, but does that individual data, I mean, you're dealing with 250 people's, I mean, ultimately the finished product is the real asset. So in the working condition, is security as great a concern at that time? Yep. The way we think about, you know, tiering, I think our vendors really is like who has access to the most amount of content and the most finished content. If you're doing special effects for a certain scene and you only get a clip of five seconds of the film, then that's obviously lower risk than in some ways like the composer ends up being an extremely risky part of the chain. Um, and that's not always the most technically sophisticated operation. It might be a person in his basement, but he needs the full film. You know, so then we have to think about how do we spoil the film? Should we give them extremely low res version of the film? So just there's just a lot of operational oh, so you, questions. So you do do things like that? Cer yeah, okay. certainly. So we really think about how can the, the, the whole game is, you know, how can we allow these creatives to contribute their best work while minimizing the amount of finished product that is exposed. And particularly, this gets particularly hard in a long time horizon. Like Avatar is being produced over seven years. It's a long time <laughs> to protect data that um, could get out early. I think another class of problems, we do a lot of live entertainment. So Fox Sports, Super Bowl 2020, you know, Women's World Cup this summer, you should all watch, it's gonna be awesome. In France, and live delivery, we also have the number one news channel, that inspires some passion, um, and websites. So I think live presents another whole different set of challenges. And you know, I talked a lot about piracy, which is certainly the case in film and television. In live, it really ends up being all about you know what seems kind of simple, but like actually getting content to air reliably at scale across heterogeneous environments with no latency. It's particularly as the case in sports, um, is paramount and there's a lot of ways that you could have security things go wrong that have massive brand and reputation impact to the firm. So disruption becomes much more important as kind of the, the security issue that we look at. What do you think of this pitch? I want everyone in this room to brace themselves for what, what I'm about to read, all right? So tip of the hat to Christopher Steely of Barclays for providing this pitch he received. The company name has been removed Sit back and listen to this pitch. Shared drives, messaging, any content exchange. Company X provides unprecedented prevention of APTs, phishing, malware, impersonation, and BEC attacks with the speed, scale, and flexibility 
of the cloud. Outperforms any other threat detection on the market. We stop malicious content, files, and URLs from infiltrating your organization via any collaboration channel. Unique CPU level visibility plus deep scanning capabilities detect the unknown attacks like zero days and end days, pre-malware release. In addition, multi-layered technology combines multiple threat intelligence, image recognition, and static engines to prevent phishing and commodity malware. Our service deploys in one click, has virtually zero scanning delay and limitless scale so your employees can collaborate both securely and seamlessly wherever they are. Melody, you're going to be out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, where to begin. So I think this pitch kind of initially reads as, you know, some of the, the next generation communication defense technologies, you know, to replace gateways and potentially do more interesting things on communications. But then, of course, they go beyond email to talk about documents and Slack or as I read into in terms of other communication platforms. The part that really got me about this one was the unique CPU level visibility claim, which was quite curious and would imply to me some type of hardware implementation as well. So that's and curious. CPU, like what other ways are we, is it some kid with binoculars looking at this? What, what other way are we looking at this? Yeah, so <laughs> I don't know how they do this, but yeah, they obviously have some kind of interaction with the hardware to be able to get that that kind of visibility. I, I guess philosophically, this just doesn't resonate with me as an approach. I think I'm generally skeptical of sending all my crown jewel communications through a single security cloud provider or cloud security provider to perform things on it before it gets to the destination. I don't think that's a good security architecture and you know, generally would rely on the platforms themselves to be providing a lot of the security rather than having this kind of single proxy-like point of failure. Mike, I just want to know where to send my check. I mean, <laughs> this is amazing. Um, Company X, I, I really want to hear from you. I, I want to write you a check, solve all my problems tomorrow. I don't see anything is in there, security that they're not solving. So this is great. Is there anything redeemable about this pitch? Nope, not a, not a thing. This feels like something that wasn't really, I, I guess, looked at, wasn't really proofread by the product side of the organization, by the founders, the executive leadership, wh whatever. I mean, this, it's frankly impossible. And I, I, can't, <laughs> I, I can't see how anyone who's receiving this is going to look at it and go, yeah, I believe you. Let's meet. So I, I, I really don't see, well, ju you... just delete it, start over from scratch, and the world will be a better place. And well, be honest, yes, maybe is usually a good start. Yeah, it's a great start. place to start. Hey, you're a CISO. What's your take on this? Amir Shihada of Veronis asks, as a sales guy, it is frustrating to hear IT security guys or CISOs tell me there are no initiatives or projects. There's always something to work on in respect to securing the data. So what advice do you have to overcome this suggestion? Melody, I'll ask you. I mean, I'm sure you've heard this. Hey, you know, what do you need protected these days? Kind of like, you know, the contractor that comes to offer you a free assessment of your house. Honestly, I think the question gets it a little bit backwards. I don't think it's on me to describe my challenges and priorities that then cold call sales person could then repeat back to me, thus incorporating their solution against it. I think it's incumbent on a company to present how they think about a problem, the problem they're trying to solve, how they're going about it, and then I can connect the dots back to my priorities and whether that resonates with me. But honestly, a pitch that begins with, I'd like to begin by understanding your, your priorities, schedule 30 minutes to discuss with you what you care about most is probably the least likely to me to, to ever elicit a response. It's not the right approach. Yes, Mike? Yeah, I, I, you know, I completely agree with Melody here that generally if you say, hey, these are my problems, the, the response is, great, we can solve those. And it doesn't really matter what your problems are. You're going to get that response back. I really, I, I look at this and this kind of response, I think is just the IT security folks, the CISO is trying to be nice. This is a nice way of saying. Stop emailing um, me. Yes, you know, not now, maybe later, you know, is, is essentially what they're, 
what this is saying. There's absolutely initiatives, but they're not necessarily initiatives that are related to the particular vendor in question to what, whatever solution that they have. So it's really more, I always come back to building the relationships. We've talked about this actually in an early article. I remember I talking to you, some open source intelligence will get you some of these answers. And oh, sure. Yeah. So yeah. You, don't, you don't have to ask them to tell you directly, do a little research, and you actually can figure a little of it out. Yes. I mean, you know, don't, don't come to a company who's clearly running everything in AWS and offer them a solution for Office 365 or a company that has released press releases about how they're going with GCP. Don't tell them how you can manage their on-premise infrastructure. Do a little bit of research. You can figure out what challenges they might be facing if you do a little bit of research and then you can open the conversation that way. Who's our sponsor this week? It's New Context, and uh, they provided this awesome space that we're in right now, and I have to thank them for sponsoring this one and the last time we did this. So let me tell you a little bit about New Context. They help Fortune 500s build secure and compliant data platforms. New Context created Lean Security. That's kind of what they're known for. It's a set of best practices designed to help enterprises manage and secure data for critical infrastructure awareness, simplification, automation, and measurement are the core principles of lean security. Learn more by going to New Context's Lean Security Manifesto. Now, New Context services include building and deploying secure and compliant data platforms, performing security assessments, driving ITOT convergence, and more generally, DevOps done right. This is kind of their thing, you should know, with DevOps and security. So in environments where security and compliance are not an option. New Context also offers LSIQ, a software product that empowers a business to continuously adapt and maintain security and compliance. The LSIQ score empowers your organization to build sustainable data security and scalable systems effectively. Reach out and find more at newcontext.com. And now this. All right, we have a bunch of questions from this awesome audience right here. Make some noise, awesome audience. Yay. There you go. All right, I'm going to burn through a bunch of these questions. I want you, Melody, and you, Mike, to give me as many awesome quick answers as you can as we can get through. Looks like a, a 10 or 10 questions here. I'm going to get through as many as I can. All right. From people coming from a non-technical background trying to lead security organizations, this is kind of a tough one. So what would be your first piece of advice? They're asking for grand advice, but I'm non-technical and I'm trying to lead a secure organization because that does happen. There are non-technical CISOs that come in. What would be your first tip, Mike? Really use your strengths, right? If you're in a position, if you've reached the point where you're either leading a security program or you're about to lead a security program, presumably something got you there. You don't have to be technical. Maybe you might have a strong focus on risk, which is not necessarily technical. You might have a strong focus on compliance, also needed in security. So focus on your strengths, try and learn the technology. You don't have to be technical, but you have to understand what's going on. But focus on your strengths and figure out how to Work with people who do understand the technical sides of things. Bring them in. Have those advisors take that advice. Melody, what's your advice? So as someone who has a non-technical educational background, I, mean, I think there's certainly many diverse paths to become security leaders. I think all of them involve becoming technical, but that, that, that can happen in a very applied setting. So I think it's about finding the opportunities to learn specific skills and, and build through applied settings. And then you can, in many cases, you know, a traditional educational context doesn't necessarily even give you what you need to succeed in security leadership roles as, as given how, how the industry is moving. And so I, I'm a big believer that most of the technical skills that you need, you can learn in, in applied ways. But I think it is an essential, you have to understand that is actually an essential part, I think, of being a, a successful CISO is to build those skills. All right. This actually comes from Mr. Alan Alford, and uh, who is my co-host of the other podcast, Defense in Depth. Is security burnout, so people like getting just too much security f information from the security teams or the, the rest of the staff, if you will, is do you believe that it's a thing that impacts an organization? And if so, 
is there a way that a CISO can uh, ameliorate it, I guess, or deal with it so people don't feel overwhelmed? Uh, so I, I guess I don't understand. You know, the, the security team, giving them the fatigue, that was it, security fatigue. Keep bugging them about security and, you know, you got to worry about this, you got to worry about this, and people like, too much of it, just now I'm not going to pay attention to it all. Do you think it's the thing? Yes, agree or disagree? I think it's a thing. I think it's kind of a manifestation of what we're seeing in the world of breach fatigue, right? Where there's so many news articles about security breaches that people stop paying as much attention to them. In a company, if you keep beating people over the head with security, eventually they're not going to be as interested in talking with you. So I, I, I believe it's a thing. So do you believe that a CISO can sort of, sort of manage that line, if you will? And do you feel that you did a good job of that? I'll leave others to, to answer the second part of that. But okay. the first part, I do think it's it's the job of the CISO to manage the way that the rest of the organization sees security. security. Yeah. So, yes, I, I do think it's the CISO. Melody, job. you're agreeing there? Yeah, I mean, I honestly think most people shouldn't need to think about security to do the right thing. So, I mean, in my environment, most of our employees are creatives. You know, they are producers and they are, you know, brilliant filmmakers. These people should not have to think about security every day. Um, and then, yeah, if I, if I were to try to get them to think that way, they would stop listening to me. I think I maintain credibility because I come to them when it really matters. But I think what I mainly try to focus on then is, you know, how do we actually give them secure defaults? So if we give them the document sharing solution that like has native built-in secure defaults that is actually like consumer grade and they love to use, you kind of get a lot for free without talking about security. And think about the same way about how, we, like our multi-factor authentication strategy was very similar. It's like, how can we, as we roll this out, actually make this better authentication experience for everyone? And so it ends up being, I, I feel like I'm talking security not that often to our users, but thinking very much about how to just embed that into their day-to-day -day life so they don't feel the fatigue. Good point. All right. Quick answers. This comes from John Prokap, CISO of HarperCollins, who was also my co-host when we did this show in New York. And this is something he's experienced, and I'm sure you have as well. What's your best tactic for handling a vendor who tries to put you on the defensive with the quote, how do you handle X risk? Melody, how do you deal with that? And have you dealt with that? I'm not too challenged by this, I think, because I... I just really wouldn't care, I think, about the, you know, the conversation. I, I just, it's like, it's so the wrong way, I think, to, to interact with a person that I haven't really, I have encountered like a bit of, you know, I think we've talked, I've heard you guys talk on the podcast in the past about, you know, do you care about security? Like, <laughs> you haven't spoken to us, so you must not, like those kinds of messages, which obviously don't resonate. Yeah, but for me, it's like, it doesn't, I don't lose much sleep, I think, over probably a question like that. Mike, how do you feel about the this one, how do you how do you handle X risk? I'm very much with Melody on this front that it just exit the conversation, right? It's like, thanks for email, have a nice day. I mean, that, that's not really, that's not something that I'm going to engage in. So you you just, you shut them down, you go yeah, somewhere. Yeah, basically. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go somewhere else. You'll go somewhere else. I, I'm going to go get a drink at the yeah, bar. Exactly. Right, there we go. Okay. What's your favorite channel to learn about new tools? So this is, this is kind of the granddaddy question of them all, if you will. Because whatever your answer is, they're, all the vendors are going to now throw their advertising dollars in that direction. So what's your favorite channel to learn about new tools? Do you have a favorite channel to learn about new tools? So the awesome thing about this is that it's not a place that they can advertise. These are the, the communities that other CISOs kind of interact with each other, that they're trying a new tool, that they've got something that they've found tremendous value in, that they're then bringing that to talk with others about, hey, here's, here's this new thing that, that I'm seeing a lot of use out of, and it's an unbiased thing. There's, there's no bias there. There's no advertising that's driving them to do that. It's just they've seen usefulness there. So I, I feel actually very safe in saying that. All right. Do you have a place where you find to learn new tools? Or are you going to answer like Mike? I actually, I, I like, I agree with that, but I also like to follow, I think there's a few conferences that, you know, present original research where companies are talking about how they've solved certain problems. Like I'm involved in the program committee of Enigma, which is my favorite security conference, sorry, RSA. And, and I think there, like these, this is organizations, I share the enterprise track, we have organizations like this year we had Uber and Netflix and Amazon each talking about how they've solved a problem and that you know, it was incorporating tools that were on the market plus things that they built around it to 
to make for, to work from their environment. Similarly, when when companies talk about what they're doing on Medium and you know begin to share their lessons, I think some companies are very forward leaning there. And even before like open sourcing solutions, just talking about the approaches and the the technologies that underpinned how they went after it. I gained, gained a lot of value from that. It's kind of the more open version of what Mike described of kind of peer knowledge. All right. Well, you're both wrong. The correct answer is uh, learn about tools on the CISO Security Vendor Relationship <laughs> Podcast, where you can advertise, Mike. I just want to point that out. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Twitter. All right. Uh, Twitter. Uh, well, I want to thank you, Mike, and I want to thank uh, Melody for uh, being here. Melody, you were awesome. And I'll tell you, the number one reason I loved having you on was that one question I asked you about how you deal with just securing these massive assets because that's something we have not talked about on this show at all and I thought you you brought it and I thought that was excellent. Well, if anyone wants to join me in the challenge, we're hiring. <laughs> oh, just like Mike used to say, but yeah. now I don't but think you're going to say, maybe you could start saying, I'm looking to be hired. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> As I said, give me a couple months and then, that, and then that's that how well. I'll be closing it. But uh, Melody, thank you very much. I, I, that, that perspective that you brought around that uh, those particular challenges that, that you face, that's not a very common challenge that many of us have to deal with. So um, that, that was great to get those insights. So thank you so much for joining us and sharing. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. If you're already a subscriber, write a review. We eagerly seek your input for the show. Please send us vendor pitches you'd like us to critique, ask us CISO questions, and anything else. If you're interested in sponsoring the show, contact David Spark at sparkmediasolutions.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast.